Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this uh, first years of uh, American Express and British Fashion Council talks. Um, very flattered to um, meet two incredible creatives here and together uh, in the same room under the same roof. It's Miles Aldridge, a fantastic photographer, famous for his uh, um, colorful imagi imagery, um, cinematic uh, um, ideas. He's been working for every um, some of the best magazines in the world, a lot for Italian Vogue, for Double Magazine, for um, uh, Love and the Pop and everyone else. Uh, and uh, next to him is uh, it's my French, um, a, another incredible creative and uh, uh, artist. She's a makeup artist um, and uh, she, you know, she can, you can be recognized, maybe we'll see some images later on, by some creative, inventive and kind of daring uh, makeup uh, that is not usual things and uh, Miles and his Maya have been working together for um, you know for some projects and uh, um, we are here actually to explore their world and um, first of all I'm very interested myself so I'm sure you're going to be more interested but how did Miles and uh, oh, the same question we love later to is my how did you start well it's interesting there was a young lady here who just came and said hello to me but I can't see her um, but anyway, she, she reminded me that um, she took over the job from Joe Matthews at <clears throat> British Vogue. Um, there she is, her. <laughs> and um, she reminded me that I met her once at a party and said, you've got big shoes to fill because Joe discovered me. And it's true. I went to um, meet Joe Matthews because um, my girlfriend was a model and she uh, had a picture that I'd taken in her portfolio. Uh, I was a struggling pop video director of, of a sort. Very bad work, generally. Um, used to kind of dream to be on the, uh, what was known as the chart show, in a, on a Sunday morning, set <laughs> my pop video show. That was the kind of the goal back then. Um, but I had this very beautiful girlfriend who was a bit kind of grungy looking, and so she suited the whole sort of grunge aesthetic. And she asked me to take a photo, which I did, and this ended up in her book. And that book ended up on the desk at Vogue, and Vogue said to her, who took this? And she said, my boyfriend. And so um, I was sort of given a card through my girlfriend, called Joe Matthews, and go up and see her. And um, she said, bring a portfolio, which I didn't have, of course, because I wasn't a photographer. And she, um, she you know, it was quite sort of ab fab. She was an amazing sort of um, larger than life fashion character, that sort of the editor in chief in Funny Face who sort of, everything has to be pink, you know. <laughs> but very loud and sweary and smoking and uh, bloody hell, this is fucking great, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, within six months I was shooting for W covers, actually. Strange, really strange story. I don't quite know, there's sort of like a bit that I can't really remember in the wilderness. You don't remember <laughs> your first uh, cover for the uh, Glossy Magazine? My first covers were for W Magazine, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, I, did a, I did a whole slew of them um, quickly. And I uh, used to get terrible butterflies because I was terrified I'd be discovered as a non-photographer. <laughs> I was just uh, sort of waiting. I used to walk around the studio while the hair and makeup were doing their job yeah. and just you know, have terrible anxiety about whether I could have this camera work. So I have to remember it's film, not digital, yeah, yeah, which, yeah. <clears throat> of course, now I'm, I know how that works. But uh, back then, you know, you don't know you've got the picture till it comes back from the lab. And there were a few experiences where it came back black. <laughs> <laughs> but not, That's a good start. Not on W. But I, 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 I literally don't know how people put up with me and my sort of lack of knowledge. And I remember trying, trying to help assistants plug in electric packs of lighting kit, and they'd say, "Just leave it alone. You don't know what you're doing." <laughs> and this guy's sort of really humiliated to be sort of told off by an assistant. And uh, between <laughs> between that, between then and now, you know, yeah. what, what um, how has been this course of you know a photographer to become a fashion photographer to become a, 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 um, a, 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 a great fashion photographer as a well respected? Um, how is uh, you know if you you know maybe some of you want to be a photographer one day, but you know how what how is the 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 eater that really a photographer should have to become a professional fashion photographer? The, um, what well, now? How do you do it now? Well, between <coughs> then and now, I mean, you know, for example, you know, you, you got a, a I was great very experience lucky. because you were exactly, yeah. Yeah, I was very lucky. And that was very much to do with uh, people weren't sure what was going on because David Sims and Corinne Day and Jurgen Teller and Craig and Glenn and all those guys, 
um, sort of started this new thing. And it meant that if you had a history before that, you were completely not cool. And it's interesting that Mario Testino has a career because then he was really considered as not cool. He was sort of too glamorous and too sexy. And that kind of look, that kind of aesthetic was completely buried, you know, yeah. for about six months, nearly 12 months. And so that was the only reason that I kind of succeeded then was because I had no history. So, uh, the, like, nobody could complain about me. But there's a whole, if you look at photography in 1994, there's a whole bunch of photographers that don't exist anymore. They literally yeah. just all fell off the end of the, the earth, you know. Um, and now, I mean, I, um, you know, I did that for a while and I had this sort of meteoric success, for, which I, I don't really know why, but I did uh, covers and blah, blah, blah. But I did, at a certain point, look at all this work and just think it was complete crap and just thought, God, it's so boring, you know. And, uh, and this is somebody who, you know, the whole thing about the pop videos was that I actually really wanted to be a film director. Okay. Like, I've always wanted to be Hitchcock or Lynch, basically. Okay. Well, but directing pop videos for pop bands is not really the way to the do same. it. No. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, that was always the sort of the, my sort of raison d'etre. Um, and I sort of looked at this, these white background covers of these, these girls. They were pretty in, enough, you know, in sort of a grungy, light way, you know. But um, just sort of incredibly inane and not, not coming from this person who sort of was interested in Lynch and Hitchcock and darker things and weirder things. And so I started to do drawings to bring me back to kind of taking charge of the picture and controlling the picture. Right. And then I could sort of have, because the problem with the fashion shoot is my, tell me what you think, but you know, you get on a fashion shoot and it has, I mean, this is my memory of it back in New York when I started. The fashion shoot will occur whether the photographer does anything or not, more or less. You have the hair and makeup team doing something and the stylist doing something. And the, the, the momentum of the shoot is such that the girl gets dressed, yeah. she gets placed in the, on the white studio background. And, uh, and uh, I mean, I almost felt redundant sometimes as a photographer, but I, get, I don't know if I'm explaining myself, but what I mean is that there's a, there's a massive momentum. The picture yeah. will get taken regardless of whether you have a thought in your head or not. Mm -hmm. So I started to try and have a thought in advance, whether it was in the pub or in the home drawings and we used to bring those drawings wrapped up it folded up in my pocket and show them to maybe one some, the star list and say what do you think well, obviously it's often too late to then bring a car into the studio where it was <laughs> but bit by bit I sort of understood how to take control of the, yeah. of the, of the picture so that's my story that's my okay. advice about how to be a photographer I, yeah. I think that's really important actually because Miles is the only photographer I've worked with that's approached it in that way I mean nobody I know says I've got a load of sketches um, I'm gonna send them to you and this is my sort of vision and the problem is when you're um, you're working in fashion everybody has a, an opinion and everybody's kind of got their own idea of what they want to bring to the shoot and their own aesthetic and unless I think the brilliance comes when everybody who's on board really understands kind of what the goal is or what the visual is yeah. and it's so helpful for yeah. makeup artists here to have the kind of original vision yeah. before we get to work. And do you think the way you know shoots uh, in the past were like literally maybe something happening at the last minute because you know the photographer came up with an idea the makeup artist you know didn't feel that you know makeup and with another thing between then and now where you know working on fashion shoot myself, you know, you receive, you know, you work on a mood board, you know, now it's much easier to share mood boards with everyone else, you know, with the agency of the makeup or the hair, the photographer. Do you think that is facilitating the job of a shoot to be on a shoot because you have more reference, so you arrive there and be more prepared? Or does that kill a bit of the kind of uh, the momentum of, you know, changing the things at the last minute? I think, um do you know what I'm trying to say? Is I, that sometimes the, the best picture comes from a mistake or because you didn't th want think, to do that? Or? Yeah, people use referencing very differently and actually it's quite a pleasure working with Miles because you have an amazing bank of images. Yeah. And I mean, and for me, I tr because of what I'm trying to do is create something new, if I start referencing or looking at other makeup artists' work, I find it very, very stifling. It's the last place I really want to look. So. I, I suppose advice or encouragement for any other creatives in hair and makeup would be to just really look elsewhere because you won't create something new. Yeah. Whereas 
Miles is then approaching his referencing from a completely different perspective, so it'll inspire us in a different way, looking mm-hmm. at film stills yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. from films or, or paintings. And, um, exactly. Where is your main um, point of reference when you look for, you know, when you search on, right now, of course, I'm saying when you search online yeah. for, uh, you know, for, a, for a story, for a shoot? What? I mean, is it film stills, pictures? Well, it's often, it's, often, it's nearly always uh, from life, actually. So it's often would be um, somebody I know or somebody I remember or something like that. So it's a personal experience, you know. And, um, but then you kind of, I, I guess my sort of way of approaching work is that it's real life, but as, as if it was shot in a Hollywood musical. So the ketchup is really bright red and uh, the girl is really pretty, you know, and uh, the hair is really blowing and, you know, all these sort of, elements of cinema conceit mm-hmm. that I like to add and layer onto it. So typically I'll <clears throat> think of a picture, you know, well, like a bottle of ketchup falling on the floor, mm-hmm. uh, which happened in my... I think there is uh, some in your website with mm-hmm. some ketchup somewhat. Now you said, uh, maybe yeah. at the beginning, no? There's you, you, I mean, it may be there, but, but, but my point being... I love that the idea of ketchup, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the point being that my, my, my wife at the time, uh, she brought the, um, you know, in a sort of very domestic goddess way, kind of walked into the living room with the dinner on the, on the tray with the ketchup, and as she came in, the ketchup wobbled and it <laughs> crashed onto the floor, and I saw that and I thought, oh, I love that image, it's really cool, and so I started drawing it, in, you know, I mean, typically she would go to bed early with the kids, and I would stay up watching films and drawing, and so I drew this ketchup and it became more and more interesting to me, it became like a poster for a movie, uh, like an Italian horror movie, like Suspiria, for example. And that's what happened. So then I started thinking about Suspiria, and I said, well, then I would watch Suspiria. But this is back in the day before digital cameras, so I'd watch Suspiria with a Polaroid camera, taking Polaroids <laughs> off the screen, <laughs> and then go to the shoot with all these, you know, screen grabs. Yeah. So and then I would sort of cross reference to probably, you know, Hitchcock and, and Lynch. But it's it's interesting. This is all this is 2000 that picture actually. So it's really the early days of the internet, mm-hmm. and my my sort of form of reference would be to go to one of the great bookshops on Charing Cross Road and flip through them, you know. And I, I realised I've been doing that, you know, kind of all my life, actually, because my father, um, who was a very sort of famous and successful and interesting illustrator in the 1960s, and uh, I should remember walking down this very street with him many times as a young boy, thinking, God, I just want to be him, you know, because he was sort of such a hero to me. But um, what, what I got from him was this sort of obsession with books and he always had a, a fantastic library, um, and it was kind of, as a young man, going through those books, finding the pictures inside the covers, not just the covers, sort of like Hieronymus Bosch, or Superman, or Picasso, or, or Miles Davis album covers. You know, things, sort of layers and layers of things. And I think it was a sort of layering of references that, in a way, that's what my work is kind of really stemming from. It, it's a kind of... Kind of like like all art is a kind of catharsis. So it's trying to, you know, why am I so drawn to the this bloody scene of this, you know, uh, ketchup? Um, I can't tell you, but it, you know, I am. But you know, I need to expunge some kind of feelings about that, and I do it through my art, you know. And and uh, the way I do that because I'm postmodern, or even post postmodern now, I'm not quite sure, is that it's all about going through everything. But Isamaya's point is very pertinent, I think, is that. Uh, it's not the same thing to just go through lots of old-fashioned magazines and regurgitate fashion ideas. That's got nothing to do with what my technique is. And I think that technique, and also the sort of democratization of this photo studio is another thing where the makeup artist, the hairdresser, even the goddamn assistants all have an opinion. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it's with the digitizing of photography that that idea of the sort of the, the, the manic sort of uh, genius, if, if you like, the Avid and the Newton, who have it all going on in their head, um, they're kind of like dictator versus, you know, what we're kind of going towards now is something more egalitarian. And, uh, I think yeah. it's a, quite a weird time for, or um, well, this generation of creatives because Definitely. Yeah, we've had we've had uh, you know the last decades have been so stylized twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, etc. And um, and so over referenced, and we're kind of it's kind of crossing um, a bridge now into the the future of the digital world, which that throws in all these other other elements. And I think people still aren't 
convinced or quite capable of knowing what they're dealing with and people don't want to keep referencing things but they also not quite sure how to move forward because of this new kind of techie age so it is and I think that's why your prints are still so iconic because they're still very stylized and they still capture that kind of feeling and everything you just talked about but now there's this weird blurry line where you've got half the crowd going over the top and digital and really embracing that and technology and um, you know 3D retouching, all the rest. And then you've got the other half who really want to reject that yeah. and look back to like the 90s and using Mamiya's and kind of film camera and want to do like this very bare minimum stuff. And so you've kind of got these two sides competing. Yeah, and, uh, and actually talking about this, uh, you know, you, you started when there were still films you know, so yeah. shooting with the film, with the rolls, you know, the famous five rolls per picture. Mm -hmm. You know, you did four, maximum five picture per day mm -hmm. on an editorial if you were lucky. Per shot, um, yeah. and Per, per shot. shot, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, having the Polaroids under the armpit, you know, <laughs> warm up. Yeah. Um, and now it's much easier, much quicker. I mean, easier, I don't know, much quicker, mm -hmm. you know, got the digital. Do you think there is a difference, I'm asking both of you, um, between shooting film or digital? shooting digital from a technical point of view, from a mood point of view, or from you know, doing 10 pictures a day now, for example, rather than five. Does, mm. has it changed the way we see fashion and we see photography? What do you think? Or fashion photography? You've done, you do, uh, I mean, I still shoot on film and I still have uh, Polaroids okay. on my own pen. Um, so Ismai does that with me, but I imagine most of the photographers are digital, are they? Mo most are digital. I think yeah. that uh, from, our side of uh, of the color armor, it, I think it's just about trust, you know, and building up a relationship with a photographer who, well, we don't get to see what's being taken. The only thing we see is a, a test Polaroid, and Miles actually always asks the whole team to come and sit down and look at each Polaroid, and it's very helpful because rare. it's very rare. It's like, yeah. It's, it's a bit like story time. They will come on, kids, come on, let's have a look at this, and what do you think? Yeah, and I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, but I do think that's also, I think, part of the reason that people are also uh, using um, film as well is because, and I'm talking about, you know, younger mm -hmm. kids, because you have that control again over the team. Right. And I think a lot of the time, you either, you're either like a team player or you're not. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of photographers are and they have, they, you know, as well, they, they'll shoot digital and they'll invite people to, you know, talk about it and some don't. Yeah. And I, but I think it's you interesting, are, isn't because it? Because there, there is that, I, I don't know his name, Luigi, isn't it? The hairdresser, a very famous hairdresser who's now a photographer. Yeah. It's an interesting idea that actually, you know, the hairdresser has now become a photographer, you know, and that would only be able with these kind of uh, systems that are now in place of digital yeah. and this kind of everyone look crowding around the screen that at some point, this guy who really should be in the hair hair ma hair makeup room has kind of uh, gravitated and um, thought, well, I can do this, and he's probably right, you know. Yeah, exactly. Do you think now, even this is another topic that I wanted to talk about a bit later, but maybe I think this is the right time, that even with the what we love, what everyone loves here in this room, I'm sure you all do Instagram, um, that we all become photographers. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that, the, uh, yeah, I guess so. If, um, and but of course, you know, the, the, the idea, of, you know, the, the example of Luigi Moreno is uh, the, the, the top of the game, but, you know, I, actually everyone can take pictures. I mean, I love to also experience sometimes a picture on Instagram, so I'm a photographer too. Yeah. But uh, what, uh, <laughs> what, what does, will this, uh, in, you know, have an impact on the, the quality of the images that we're going to see around, even from fashion brands or? Um, I think quality is really important and I think something like Instagram which is this uh, media that's available for everybody to showcase whatever they want and sort of um, photo vomit their whole lives, it's just another mm. Facebook whatever and it's the same with um, with any kind of media, especially digital media and online, everybody I think has a voice now mm. whereas at one stage that was exclusive to, to say journalists, I don't know say like 50 years ago or something and um, there's still an element of um, of confusion there because I, th I think suddenly it means there's this legitimate space for everybody to say whatever they feel whether it's um, a, a good or bad and it's unedited isn't it un it's just there's, there's no editor-in-chief yeah. anymore it's yeah. just exactly that's, that's the thing 
Give, have you seen in your experience a bit of a difference now that, uh, you know, okay, if you can't do this job, okay, there, there will be someone else because mm. we can replicate your job or someone else's. My job? No, I mean, yeah. no, yeah. no, your job, but you know, your idea or you yeah. know, some other photographer's idea just by copying it. Mm. I mean, or. Yeah, I mean, I've. Or is this no sure risk? I mean, I've seen people try and copy my job as yeah. it were, and it's never very successful because That's I think they good. misunderstand the basic idea of it, which is what I was saying earlier, is as an artist it's about personal feelings mm -hmm. and real experience rather than something torn out from a 1960s Humper's Bazaar, right? Um, but I interweave all those things, but you know, I, so, so no, I don't think, I mean, I went to a degree show recently in um, Brighton and there was a painter who'd been copying Francis Bacon. I thought it was bizarre that his teacher had let him for three years copy Francis Bacon and then sent him out into the world to be kind of hammered. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, Francis Bacon's experience of, of Soho is, you know, getting beaten up and, and fucked and, and uh, his teeth smashed out. Real life, you know what I mean? Um, that's his story and his, his references are Moybridge and uh, so forth. I don't think artists can be copied, otherwise there'd be no value in them, you know. The, the other thing I think is um, about having an education in, the, um, in your field and something like photography, any, anything that has a visual language it becomes kind of esoteric and that things that I might notice or Miles might notice and that are very important to creating that image, the general public wouldn't. And I think that's where the quality comes in as yeah, well, and it becomes a scary... That's isn't it? That's what, to be an artist is to see things, really, and, mm, and then to the kind detail. of bring them back and yeah. say, you know, if you look at oh, so many great photographers I can think of, but like someone like Kurtej, you know, he, he was would photograph by the banks of the Seine, and uh, there's a kind of tree that he would always photograph, and it's, it's you know, he, he, he'd obviously seen that tree in uh, Czechoslovakia or wherever it was, and he was homesick for that tree, but, you know, it's it's... He noticed it, I and mean, I noticed things, as, you know, because of things I, from my childhood or from my past too, and we kind of focus on them. That's what, as, as artists, we bring them back to the world. But. Um, it's my, and, you know, going back to the original question I want to ask you, how, how did you start? Because, you know, you're, um, I think I read a bit of bio, your bio, you know, you didn't study makeup, I suppose. No, it's funny when, <laughs> actually, when... Uh, Did you again? Uh, <laughs> no, but when Miles is saying he was kind of... Um, you started in film and was kind of wandering around and a bit unsure that yeah. hoping it would go to plan. I still feel like a bit of a fraud because <laughs> yeah. no, <laughs> yeah, I, d yeah, yeah. I didn't start. I didn't start um, in makeup. I was uh, originally going to be a product designer. Mm -hmm. So my, some of my training, uh, university at least, was industrial design and working in three D. Um, and really, the makeup came about because I. <clears throat> wanted to, I didn't want to get a bar job, and um, <laughs> my sister had a school fate and asked if I could face paint, <laughs> and I did. And um, so yeah, so then I, I took up this kind of, kind of funny whatever part-time job, face painting, and then um, it became a bit over the top and mums would be like, okay, you've been 20 minutes doing a Spider-Man now, you need to do another kid, and it was, uh, I was like, okay, something's, uh, something's going on. So I, so I, I carried on during, during my studies, um, which are actually um, very, uh, very helpful because I was working with materials a lot, and I was in wood workshops and metal workshops and um, working with plastics and researching into materials, which has been, which kind of informed the way I work now. Um, <clears throat> I started applying some of these things to the bodies and the faces that I was working on. And I suppose being in London, you're mixing with creative people that are starting out and shooting and blah, blah, blah. And I, yeah, I think the first... And when was your first shoot, um, if you still remember? Yeah, well, it was for ID magazine, mm -hmm. which I didn't really know what ID magazine was. Cause, <laughs> yeah, I was... I was uh, yeah, good, great start. But I was asked to, I was asked to uh, be involved, not really as a makeup artist, right. but just to do the kind of the creative body art. And so I remember um, we, the photographer was called Matthew Stone, and he's still working, but he's more of an artist. He's more an artist, exactly. Yeah, be mad. Yeah, <laughs> and he, um, so I was, I was covering these uh, guys in in clay and stuff, and turning them into gods. And I remember there was a makeup artist on set as well. Oh, and I was kind of looking at our kits, 
And I was just like, it was me like washing up these kind of like paint rollers in the sink yeah. <laughs> and her kind of like yeah. cleaning, her deli- cleaning her delicate brushes. brushes. <laughs> and I was like, God, okay, <laughs> something's got to change. Brush envy. A br- yeah. bit of brush envy. And, and I just thought, well, I've just got to learn what she does because I'm sort of missing a trick here. So yeah, so and began. Then after that, now you become the the beauty editor of ID magazine. Yeah. So yeah. what what does it mean being a beauty editor? I mean, what what do you do there? Because, um, uh, ID. You know, getting a job as a beauty editor <laughs> in a magazine. Yes, what do you do? At ID? <laughs> um, well, luckily they are very flexible with that position. So um, I don't think I would have taken um, a position anywhere if I wasn't allowed to work for other magazines. Yeah. But I think part of being on a team is really just to. Um, cross communicate mm-hmm. everything that you see in your area of the field, and I think um, ID is great because, and like Dazed as well, a lot of the team's young, and you know that's interesting because they'll have a unique perspective. Yeah. But they're also great because they work with everybody. They don't. I don't really think there's. I think something like Italian Vogue, which is maybe a bit more of an institution. Mm-hmm. What do you think has its photographers, yeah. whereas yeah, ID is yeah, a little yeah. bit more flexible. Yeah. So. But I mean, I remember in the past, going backstage at the show, there was always, you know, typical American, you know, American uh, magazines, beauty editor being backstage and checking all this, asking questions right. about the makeup artists. What did you, you do there? Do, do you do that? No. No way. <laughs> <laughs> Not interested. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's uh, so it's a different d- different role in in a magazine to be that. I mean, you still yeah. keep on doing your well, makeup and. I think the main point is about communication, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, everyone's a be- can be a beauty editor. It's that thing of um, like quality quality control, you know, Miles can be a beauty editor, if he wants to, he can start a blog and on, get followers and get on Instagram and create this, you know, personality. So I think um, it's a really weird thing, isn't it? I mm. to and uh, using, you know, using a lot of, uh, if, you, if you check uh, uh, Ismaya, uh, Isamaya, sorry, I keep on saying Ismaya, um, website and, you know, her work, it's a, use a lot of clay and powder and a lot of graffiti on the body, a lot of body works. Um, how do you tell a story? I mean, where do you get your inspirations for uh, makeup like that, that is not, you know, just mm. blue eyeshadows and red lipstick? Well, I definitely went through a period for a few years um, of kind of exploring the images kind of compositionally and uh, luckily at the time that I started there was a, suddenly a craze again for like big punchy powerful makeup and mm-hmm. kind of that sort of thing and I've kind of tired of that now and I sort of miss the narrative and I, I often get sort of disappointed when people still ask for an image that doesn't have any narrative there's no character they just want a blue arm or they just want you know a, a pink face or like do you know what I mean there's no like richness there's no context to it anymore and um i think you know, i got all of that out of my system and you know enjoy but but for me it always i suppose starts with the narrative or the character rather than the makeup and definitely i won't do any makeup if it's not right i'm very happy to it's about the visual at the end of the day and um it's only necessary if it's necessary yeah. so. and how did you how did you do sorry the two of you met sorry <laughs> Because uh, you worked together a few times now. I don't know, Vogue Italia, I guess. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the shoot? Yeah. It was... Was it France, this? Is that the first one? Yes, it was, yeah. What Patty. Was she? With Patty, up a tree. So, yeah. No, was it uh, the tree was one before? Was it one before? Now. With Patty Wilson as a stylist. Okay. She's, she's yeah. Yeah. It might have been yeah. that one, actually. Might have been. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what happened? I just tell I, me how, I, how, did, how does it work? I know, just like thought, who's this little twit, you know, just <laughs> walking around. Charming. <laughs> yeah. It turned out to be the makeup artist. She's so young, you know. Um, so you turned out in the studio. Uh, you yeah. didn't know any, any of her no, work? No, no. Okay, good. And, uh, and then what happened? And, um, well, she what? was brilliant. She was brilliant and confident and fast. And those, those things, are, those three things are really what you want, you know. Any body paint or...? No, it was, it was quite simple, but it was really well chosen colours and quick to change. And, you know, of course, it was, as is my said, she, everyone looks at the Polaroids and that's when you have a chance as a hairdresser makeup artist starts to change something. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I could see or feel instantly that she was incredibly, you know, receptive to, to that. And I've, really, I've worked for a long time with a lot of different makeup artists. people, hair and makeup people. And, you know, some are easy to work with, some are, some are really difficult. That's, that's, you know, they're kind of... They're artists as well, you know, they're mm-hmm. sensitive people, so you've got to be 
conscious of like how do I tell <coughs> Peter Gray I hate the hair after we spent three hours doing it, you know. Um, Peter! You don't, you don't, no. <laughs> it happens. You idiot. <laughs> I, so. I, I think that's the other thing though is um, because as, again it's not, I'm not going to a shoot with Miles or anyone to try and make a statement, to try and paint a face blue. It's about, and actually that was something that doing a course in product design was really helpful for because it helped you understand what a brand, brand's aesthetic is. Because the idea with that is that you, you go and work for a brand, you understand their vision and you, can't, you try and... Uh, Stay within the parameters. Yeah, the parameters. At, at the same time trying to influence mm. it with your own sort of aesthetic. And I think that also works in the fashion field because a photographer has his aesthetic, he's a brand, a stylist does, yeah. they're a brand. And so it's with hair and makeup, it's trying to understand their vision. But at the same time trying to influence it with a little bit of yours. Absolutely. I mean, it'd be crazy well, the, the, to I mean, do it. It makes a lot of sense because the, the, the project we did, the girl kind of looked a bit like um, a mannequin in a tree, you know, and so she was a bit plastic and so his mind was great with, you know, sort of skin texture and, mm -hmm. and uh, fake eyelashes that, mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I, you know, I like working with people, you know, well, I like working with Isamaya. Uh, I was gonna say people like Isamaya, but she's the only <laughs> one like Isamaya. <laughs> but, um, she's the you know, uh, <laughs> It's, I have the idea, I'm not saying I'm a genius, I have the idea, it's my idea, right, the girl in the tree, for example. But then the whole point is to work with these people and let them have free, free reign, yeah. you know, and you have, you, the, the job is rather like being a director, but it's also like being a producer, and, and I think a good producer is about getting great people together yeah. and sort of like, well, where would this guy go with this project, or, you know. Well, I suppose, you know, the importance yeah. of a team, you know, gives the, the, yeah. the, the good results at the end of the day. And yeah. that's what you want. So I think a very oiled uh, team helps. But it would be silly to think that the best shoots are where everyone's friendly and happy and in a great team mm. working together. Because, you know, you, d you don't just get booked because you're a nice person. You have to yeah. also be, which is my is, but you, you have to also ha bring, have something, you know, you to have create. some sort of crack in your, in your, in yeah. your soul that helps. Yeah. Come out, no, Miles, uh, talking about you know <laughs> the freedom of uh, you know ideas from the team yeah. and you know your photography and you, you've been working for lots of magazines. Um, we see a lot of your work in Italian Vogue because yeah. I suppose it's still maybe the only platform where you can be more free. Um, is this correct or you know how does sometimes your crazy ideas of having you know again you know like I love that Mac Mac campaign that you did right. with the with the, with the, the, the dogs. dogs with the yeah. same the models that is fantastic. I mean. How can you sell sometimes your stories to a magazine mm -hmm. while they want to respect their own vision? You know, like um, well, I've worked with Vogue, uh, Vogue Italian, uh, since the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, really, really early on, from those very early days at W. Actually, mm -hmm. um, Franca Zazzani asked me to do the same kind of white background pictures for her, and so I started doing that. But that's also when I, I started to kind of change as well and bring narrative and, mm. and darkness and strangeness and cinematic kind of things into, into the work. So Italian Vogue has always been there as a kind of constant and I'm really, of course, so thankful because I certainly wouldn't have this career without them because it's, it's especially through the really kind of lean periods and what I mean is the recessions and the sort of, I mean also, I don't just mean financial recessions, I mean visual recessions mm -hmm. where people became, certainly after 9-11, people became incredibly anxious about anything sort of dark or sinister. And so my, my ketchup bottle, you know, came out exactly at that time. Um, you know, it wasn't for everyone, it wasn't everyone's sort of cup of tea, if you get me. And, and uh, I, uh, regardless of that, Vogue stayed with me, kept, you know, we would always meet every, uh, every uh, season after the Chanel show at the Ritz and talk about new ideas. And Franca Sozani, the boss, would always kind of, um, I, I always go with drawings, you know, a bunch of drawings, ideas. <clears throat> and she would always team my drawings up with what she'd seen in the shows thus far, you know. And that's how we kind of work. We just, it's a kind of continuity that I've had. And I, I like that continuity. I, I've, I've worked with various magazines. I mean, American Vogue is a whole big story. I've worked with them for a bit. And, the challenge is really to do good work for them because it's easy to do bad work, and I think most ple people do because of the sort of the micromanaging that goes on in that magazine. Frank is much more like, it's your idea, you do it. If it's if it's shit, I won't print it. But in all the twenty years, she didn't print one story, which is a long story to explain. But she didn't. But you know, so 
I, I think having that, that kind of boss um, where she gives you enough rope to hang yourself, but you just inherently won't. You don't want to. You want to stay within the parameters. A bit like you were saying with the product design sort of rules. Is you want to, you know, it wants to be part of the Vogue Italia brand. You want to tell your story without going too far. But I always think that it's very similar to like Hollywood in the 50s and 60s when you had all these amazing directors um, who were working in the studio system and still managed to create these amazing visuals, ideas that were, I, I really believe, if left to their own devices without the limiting factor of the studio, they wouldn't have produced these incredible films. It's having that sort of restraint with that passion, that urge that creates, I think, great art. You know, I think the artists left to their own device can just be too self-indulgent. So I, I've really liked having that sort of filter on the work and that kind of, can I do this? No, you can't, you know, sort of feeling, you know. It makes it more accessible, mm. I think, as well. Yeah. You know, because you can very easily alienate people. Yeah. And that's something like, for example, when you were speaking about the Instagram, um, is a tricky one because it's the only one of the main outlets now for your own, um, for kind of curating your own identity visually. You, and, and there's, it's just an open source for everybody to see. You still have to be careful within those parameters because as you say, it's so easy to offend people. Yeah, absolutely. And because, you know, once the ball starts rolling, you've got 10,000 people saying, you, you, you say, you're saying this, and you're like, I'm not saying any of that. Uh, not exactly. Yes, yeah, so it's how very do, difficult. How do you use your Instagram? I mean, there's a same question to my, to, to my I mean, personally, no, for, for yeah. work. Yeah. Um, it's very important for me because, uh, because I am quite creative. Um, I have an agency, and of course, they like to market me in one way, and I like to market myself in another way. <laughs> so it's all about. Um, I suppose it's a, it's a really great place for showing people how you really feel and showing people the work that you really want to be seen and how you wish to be presented. Because, I mean, I don't take photos of my dinner <laughs> and my dogs. But um, so in one sense, I'm still very private, even though I put a lot of work up there. But it's all very managed, um, I suppose, as my vision, whereas... And do you yeah. look through all the, the comments and you know what people say about, for example, if you uh, put a picture of you know the latest job for Italian mm. or whatever, do you, do you look at that and it's always just? Well, it's it's actually so helpful something like Instagram because it it's obviously that instantaneous feedback, and um, so yeah, it's amazing to see the things that people react to well mm -hmm. to and the things that they don't. And it, I mean, sometimes I'm confused and it's like. I think I've put up something that everyone will like. No one <laughs> likes it. it. <laughs> what do they want? I don't, you know. But it's great anyway, just to understand um, if you work, you know, how media works, yeah. and especially if you go on to work for a brand, to understand the things that people want to see, yeah. and then be able to then, uh, you know, you utilize all of that kind of. Did you ever get a booking through your Instagram? Like yeah, a few times, yeah. Really? Quite a lot. Well, yeah, regularly, actually. So it's like another agent, if you want. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And then you have to call your agent to say, can you deal with it, yeah? Yeah. And then take it 20% off. Right? <laughs> but, you know, that, exactly, yeah. The only thing is, I mean, if I hadn't ha curated my Instagram in the way that it was, and they'd just gone to my agency, they probably wouldn't have booked me, because my agency is right. much safer. Mm. And uh, so I don't really want, you know, I don't want any restrictions ultimately to be sort of imposed on the work that I'm producing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same for you, Miles. I mean, Instagram, you use it as a, as a like, a, a open window to the world for your work, or...? Yes, I do. I do now. I, I mean, I think, like, a lot of people, when it first turned up, I just, it was a kind of way of, you know, showing things that I saw in, in the world, you know. Um, I remember posting a picture of some bags of... Coloured, uh, coloured bags of dog poo that I thought were fascinating, but it's got some very horrible comments. <laughs> um, Curious to see. So yeah, it's in the history. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I mean, there's a few things to talk about that. I mean, uh, I think the Instagram for me has replaced, uh, unfortunately, um, I'm not very happy about it, but my Leica, because I used to always carry my Leica with me. And so those things I would see typically on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, because um, I mean, I think part of being a photographer is taking pictures. Yeah. 
um, I wouldn't say it's the only thing, but I think taking pictures on a regular basis, and I always say to people who are just starting out, particularly uh, men, boys, is that you know the best thing you do is take photographs of your girlfriend all the time, you know, when she's asleep, when she's waking up, when she's having breakfast, when she's on the toilet, in the shower, and that's how you start to learn your kind of visual language about women, you know. Um, so, but I didn't mean I didn't mean taking them on an iPhone. I meant taking them properly or with a camera because that sort of having that constant sort of I used to just carry it with me all the time, you know, yeah. and just constantly taking pictures, and and, and then actually going and having them printed up, printing them up, and seeing what was there, what it was, you know, sort of the light coming off the reflections, the water, the uh, the shadows, the you know, um, the I always found that the, the personal work kind of informed the public work, mm -hmm. you know, so if I was at a playground with one of my children taking pictures there, I, the, I suddenly were doing a, a shoot at Vogue Italia about a, a, kid, a mum at a playground, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, that sort of thing. And I don't get, this, don't quite get the same thing with my iPhone, but it's just frustrating that it has really replaced that. Um, but now, in answer to your question, ultimately, uh, Instagram is, is a, for me, it's a great way of just kind of mentioning things that I'm doing, exhibitions, books. I, I don't think, it just seems really inappropriate to be incredibly truthful and personal yeah. when, uh, you know, I've, uh, there's so much phoniness on that, and baloney. And it's weird, know. isn't it, because it's almost like people then become disengaged with their actual emotions. I'm sure yeah. they are, yeah. And, you know, it and it and having an emotion yeah. and then displaying it and then waiting for the feedback. Mm, I just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. am I really sad? Or do mm. I look gorgeous when I'm really sad? Mm, exactly. And it's this very like weird and, uh, kind but of... But I feel like, you know, also with the, the, the younger generation, I mean, younger than, than me and you for sure, minus maybe your generation, um, it's very much like losing the momentum of everything. I mean, you go to a mm. concert, it's all, everyone is with the mobile app, where yes. the act is happening then. Instead of being and, in you know, the moment, I pay sure. the ticket to go and, and sing along, yeah, or yeah. to dance, whatever this concert, but you, you lose it, and again, waiting for the, oh, many likes of people, how many likes? How many people like me being at the concert? I mean, who doesn't really care? Yeah, yeah. But I suppose you know it's a different. Uh, um I, th I think a lot of that's also kind of driven by fear because all of these tools, of Facebook and Instagram, they're very clever in that they do instill fear into you because it's fear of not being within a community. And I think as humans, that's something we're driven to naturally anyway. We've evolved to you know be in groups mm -hmm. and to yeah. communicate with each other. And this is just another extension, but a digital extension of that. So having that feedback, we know scientifically that it produces certain chemicals in the brain and stuff, and the number of mm -hmm. likes yeah. produces that Dread kind of... Everything. Yeah, so yeah. I think um, that's obviously... Yeah, it's obviously a very like intelligent way, but very kind of sad way of actually... It's not really about the happy stuff. It's about these people are just behaving, I suppose, with fear, and fear of of not being, not really being able to like internalize anything anymore. So I feel I have to externalize everything. And um, yeah. mm. um, going back a bit to your work, I mean, you, you must have you know gone through all the images of Miles' work. Um, <laughs> some of the pictures that actually most like of your work, I must say, they're all the super bright, colorful, um, crazy, quirky situations of ladies with big mm. hair and and red eyes, you know, that I'm sure as I might have has done some of that. Um, How does that process of colors work? I mean, now with a lot of photographers, as we said earlier on, they use a lot of post-production, you can yeah. enhance colors and make them be darker, but you can do everything. Yeah. That. You use a lot of that in no, I don't. super no. color. For example, an image like that. No, hardly anything at all. I mean, as I said earlier, I still shoot on film, and film's still the best. Um, but you can use post production. You know, can you I do use post production. We we shoot on I shoot on color neg and then we scan the neg. Yeah. And then um, then it, there, th at that point it's now digital, mm -hmm. and you can work on it in Photoshop. But I really uh, try to avoid a few things. I don't like retouching faces at all. Mm -hmm. So try and get that right with makeup and and some lighting. Um, and then color. It's really you know conversations with stylists and set designers and makeup artists right. bring colors to the table and kind of like how I mean I said right now I just feel in a way you can almost do no wrong with color you just keep putting more and more things until it breaks yeah. and then you can but I don't, I'm not really into it being good taste at the moment I just think it should just be more and more and more and more is that a response to uh, <laughs> what's going on <laughs> on Instagram maybe yeah. 
uh, but also I, I think it's, all, it's about, I mean, lots of things going on in that, but I think it's also trying to grab people's attention. Yeah. And that's, you know, when I started photography, there were some really great photographers in really great magazines. And, um, you know, that is less and less the case, unfortunately, because of the magazines. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I was lucky. I started in a really competitive time with brilliant yeah. people who, who weren't only brilliant, but they loved, the, the, they loved magazines. Yeah. Because so, you were at the same time of David Seams and yeah. uh, Glenn Latchford yeah. and... Um, Craig and yeah. Jürgen. Jürgen. I mean, so. you know, really important uh, visual... There was a very good times of the yeah. IDN days, no one there. The magazines were fantastic, yeah. you know. And we would look forward to the magazines, but not only the magazines, we look forward to the campaigns because they were so well done. Yeah. And now you can't even look at them, you know, it's so boring. Um, yeah, that's, that's the other things. I mean, magazines today, I mean, what, what's your view on, uh, apart oh, from Vogue Italia? I just told still, you. <laughs> but, but I mean, more than that, I remember also with the campaigns, I remember waiting for the March issue, so the September issue, to, to see, see the them, new yeah. campaign, yeah, you know, yeah. the excitement of the new clothes. Now it's all like... Okay. Marketing-ish, marketing. Yeah, you know, yeah, I guess. yeah. I mean, I had a conversation with a, um, uh, an advertiser recently, and, you know, they want to wait to see what's the best-selling clothes before they do the before they do the advertising campaign. It's completely the opposite of what we used to do, which was you find yeah. the clothes that make the best picture, you know, and then you sell a thousand boring clothes yeah. after that. It's, you know, it's... It's, it's becoming more corporate, pictures. isn't yeah. it? And that's yeah. the thing with uh, styling as well, which I wasn't aware until quite recently, is that now a lot of designers, I think most, won't allow you to mix to and mix match. With it, yeah. And that's like... In editorial? No. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now you can only wear this there designer head to toe. Where you cannot mix, you know, let's say, um, a Celine top yeah. with a Gucci well, It's the revenge no, of the no. brand because, you know, back in the day, the Vogue control, would just yeah, control again, them yeah, so much. Again, you know, the control of the them. brand, you know, yeah. to say that, you know, has to be seen like this, has to be sold like yeah. that. And, you know, this is the integrity of that. Now, talking about integrity, yeah. when you shoot campaigns, you know, I know you've been working for Hermes, Top Shop, and, you know, you've done Mac campaigns, or whatever. How much freedom, again, talking about freedom and creativity, because I think Miles and, uh, um, it's Miles, sorry, it's, it's Miles, Miles, yes. Uh, are some of the most creative people of today. Um, how much of your freedom you have when you shoot campaigns, and how it is the process today with the creative directors and brands? I mean, they're all different. Everyone's different, of course. But I mean, I am extremely lucky with Mac because, again, rather like Franca, it is every sort of. I think I've done eight years with Mac now, and eight, eight years times four campaigns a year, so it's a lot of a lot of pictures. And we did a book recently of the last seven years of work mm -hmm. um, with James Gager and myself. Um, and and um, I mean, James is a fan, which is what's so lovely. So he'll see my Vogue Italia and he's, oh, Miles, do you think you could do something a bit like that for us? You won't like that impersonation. I hope you don't see that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, and, you know, from that moment, so that moment, can you do something like that for, and then to the final product? Yeah, is yeah. Is there a lot of changes or is it still? Uh, no, he's very, very, very um, supportive and, and respectful of the, of the work. Uh, and actually, you know, really wants it to be my my vision um but it's now we've had so many brilliant kind of campaigns together that he it's now at the point where he's sort of in my head he's almost kind of like he comes up oh i had an idea about a woman at a bowling club what do you think and it's like oh that's such a good idea you know it's like really like an idea i would have done you know because yeah. the colors of the balls and all that stuff so between us we i think we've just both really love color we both really like weirdness his brand is particularly about really inclusivity and not um, being kind of... Celebrate. Yeah, I think where we both agree is that, you know, when I started photography, because my sister had been a model um, and she sort of celebrated and kind of extolled this idea of beauty will make you happy, right? Like kind of the on the yacht with the martini with the great guy. Um, I never believed all that and I thought it was because I knew her and she wasn't like that and I thought this is complete bullshit. So when I got my chance, I, um, I just wanted to say the opposite. You know, yeah, you're on the yacht, but it's, it's on fire and it's sinking and there's sharks. You know, and the guy's not great. He doesn't love you, you know, he hates you. He's sleeping with a skipper. You want uh, to be somewhere else, exactly, like yeah, that, with yeah, another boy. Fucked. Your life is exactly. fucked, you shouldn't have the surgery, yeah. <laughs> all of that. So me and James kind of agree about it because neither of us like the idea that it's about making you happy, you know, it's just, a bit more cynical. Yeah, a bit more cynical and a bit more truthful in a yeah. way, and about uh, just about life, you know. You know. And w w what's your role, you know, when you do campaigns, when you ask to do campaigns? I mean, do they respect your editorial work, or they just, you know, oh, it's... 
Yeah, I think um, actually going back to uh, working with a brand like Mac, it was the first time um, that I felt, because it's, a, it's a, still a commercial brand, yeah. that I was being pushed by James. And, and I, you know, something I, I, I did some makeup. You know, Mac is a brand, we're creative. It's just not creative enough. And I was <laughs> just like, what? This, yeah, but that's great because it's, uh, it's not really that often that you really get pushed yeah. to go further, you know. Um, if I'm generally, it's just like rein it in as a mayor, so you've gone over the top. But really he's, and he does it in a very controlled way. It's still very... Yeah, he's very respectful. Respectful, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's great. So Fantastic. great. Yeah. Well, I think we are going towards the end of our conversation. One silly question for both of you. What has been the funniest, almost stupid uh, situation you found yourself on a shoot? <laughs> Should I start? Mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe together. Maybe. I think, um, oh God, revealing too much now. Uh, when Go I first it. started out, I was, um, I was working with artists a lot as well, and with Matthew Stone, and, who, uh, and I was the body painter. And that's really all of the body. So I, okay. uh, uh, for a while, okay. <laughs> I became word, of, word, okay. yeah, <laughs> word of mouth. Yeah. And then I got loads of bookings and I was like, this isn't my job. <laughs> this is not okay. my job. <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah. Uh, what, what about you, Miles, if you still remember? I mean, sure, I you mean, had I'm so many. I'm not sure. I don't think I have one superior stupid moment. The whole, my whole life has been one long, <laughs> drawn out stupid <laughs> moment. I just, uh, when I think of all the, the flashbacks of kind of, dresses arriving on courier to be shot quickly in, yeah. in Paris or working with Polly Mellon or Richard Avedon coming into my studio and mm -hmm. saying, oh, you're Miles Aldridge. You know, all these kind of wonderful, <laughs> silly things that wouldn't have happened to me if I wasn't, didn't pick up my camera and take a photograph of my girlfriend when she asked me to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Miles. Thank you. Thank you very much.